Hi, and welcome to this channel. I'm Claire, and I love talking about arms armor, women's histories, and the weird, wonderful ways these two subjects often intersect. And today, I want to talk about video games. So welcome to a new tentative series on my channel, Arms and Arcades, where I'm going to be talking about video games and arms and armor. And I'm going to try, as always, to bring a little bit of a queer and feminist twist on things, because I always do, somehow. <laughs> so I've been discovering lots of new games during the past year and a half, and one of these games has actually become one of my favorite video games, and that is Hades. It's essentially a video game where you play Zagreus, the son of Hades, the ruler of the underworld in Greek mythology, and the whole game is really uh, getting him to try and escape the underworld to join his um, godly uh, relatives on Mount Olympus. It is a roguelike, so shifting levels um, basically uh, every time you play again. It's actually inbuilt in the game um, that, you know, when you're battling your way through the underworld, you will die and you will return to the house of Hades. But each time you you fail and you return to the house, you're slowly gaining more experience, you're developing more relationships with characters in the house and beyond, you're gaining more points and gaining more power, and it kind of uh, establishes failure over and over again as one of the main features of the game. Main points of, for me that make this game so interesting is just uh, the story, the voice actors, the, the character design, just that the overall design of the game is visually stunning, but also the accessibility, because you have so this normal setting, this normal mode in which you're going to die a lot and you're slowly going to be able to build up, you know, build up your skills in order to learn how to defeat these monsters. But there's also a mode called the God Mode, in which each time you, you die, instead of just going back from, from square one, you're also building building more resilience. And for many players, like myself, you don't have to focus so much on learning how to beat the monsters, and you can focus a bit more on on the game's narration, on, on the story, on different characters, and that requires lots of battling your way through uh, different levels that are always changing and uh, battling different monsters with different weapons. The core feature of the game is that each time Zagreus attempts to fight his way outside of the underworld, he can pick one weapon in all the arsenal of weapons that he has at the House of Hades. And obviously those different weapons have lots of different cool exciting features that you can unlock and that will make the style of fighting very very different. Throughout the game there's also uh, gods that kind of uh, send messages to Zagreus and offer him boons uh, that make weapons uh, have different kind of effects. So I wanted to have a look at all these fictional fantasy arms and and kind of analyze, understand how we could link them back to uh, Greek mythology and both mythological uh, and real historical weapons. The point of this video is not to nitpick, oh well, this could have been more historically accurate. What's interesting to me is taking these incredibly designed pieces of weaponry and just being able to find out how we can uh, explore a bit more around mythological and historical inspirations. So let's start with one of my favourite weapons from Hades, which is Varatha, or the Eternal Spear. So what does this bad boy do? Well, it stabby stabs and it spinny spins. Let me explain. <laughs> what this means is that it allows for long-range stab attacks and you can also charge it for a deadly spin attack, uh, which is pretty cool. You can also throw it and it will then damage enemies along the way, then you call it back to you and hey, it damages enemies on the way back. So this is what the game says in terms of extra lore around Varatha. It must have been a sight when Lord Hades wielded Varatha, the eternal spear versus the titans, driving back those fiends into the depths together with the help of his Olympian brothers and sisters. So this directly references Hades, the dead in charge, wielding it. Which also makes sense given he's also currently in the game wielding a big ass spear. So, you know, we, we kind of get that spears are kind of his thing. But that spear is more specifically a big two-pronged implement that looks more like, uh, you know, a two-pronged pitchfork. And more specifically, a bident. So is this bident true to Greek mythological lore? Absolutely. In the original lore, so Zeus, ruler of the gods of Olympus, god of thunder, 
Hades, Lord of the Underworld, kind of uh, manages the admin for all, all deceased souls arriving in the Underworld, and Poseidon, God of the Sea, are brothers. After defeating the Titans, the three brothers get these major world-ruling cosmic powers. They'll get the Earth, Zeus gets Sky, Poseidon gets the Sea, and Hades gets the Underworld, which always feels like the short end of the straw. Hades gets his Bident, Poseidon gets his Trident, and Zeus gets a bolt of lightning, which, you know, is, if you, if you think about it, is one big spear. But there's sometimes some evidence that in the classical text there's a bit of a switch around going on. Zeus is sometimes shown as a bident or trident to represent lightning as well, um, because when you look at the lightning, the sky is not only one zigzag, it's two. Very scientific terms going on in this channel. But usually the norm was that Hades had the bident and Poseidon had the trident. As depicted in this delightful Renaissance fresco painting by the painter Raphael, which has two of the grumpiest Poseidon and Hades I've ever seen. Just look at them. Uh, they just like look so unhappy to be here. So Hades has his bident and in terms of representation, he's definitely living up with his bident. A lot, but what I found really interesting about the Bident is that it's not really perceived historically, as far as I'm aware, as a weapon per se. The uses I found have ranged throughout identity from a hunting tool to hunt small animals to using it for fishing. Romans also use it as an agricultural tool, you know, for example, as a double bladed drag hoe called a Bident which was also used to break up the soil. Some people have suggested that this might have something to do with reaping the souls of the living, for example, in terms of this being an agricultural tool used for harvesting, and in the same way which the scythe is uh, used by the Grim Reaper in terms of reaping souls. I'm not really convinced by that because Hades has always been in this position of he's not the one who's taking the souls, he's the one who is basically doing all the admin to welcome the soul to welcome the soul the souls to welcome the souls into the underworld the person responsible for collecting souls in greek mythology is thanatos uh, the god of death and incidentally in uh, the video game hades thanatos also has a giant scythe thighs thighs no no thighs even though obviously that is kind of conflating him with the Grim Reaper and it's more from the later depictions of death as far as I'm aware. So back to Bidens. What's certain is that this Bident wielding by the Lord of the Underworld definitely has had some lasting cultural implications and impacts because it's also the victim of that classic thing of taking different symbols from a variety of polytheist uh, religions, so religions with different different gods and integrating them into Christian imagery. And given that Hades is a lord of the underworld, his role and his attributes were often conflated with the devil. And so demons and the devil himself started to be depicted with pitchforks. And yeah, it's worth saying, more often tridents than bidents. Maybe because, as I mentioned before, sometimes not only was there a switch around in terms of uh, Hades also wielding a trident, but sometimes Poseidon and Hades were also kind of mixed up. And it turns out that imagery-wise, that image of demons and the devil was also borrowed from other elements of Greek mythology, such as the god Pan. Half goat, check. Half man, check. Big fan of debauchery, check. In many ways, our idea of hell and Satan and the way in which we've been raised with this predominant idea of Christian imagery and Christian narratives has kind of almost retroactively influenced the way in which we view figures such as Hades and realms such as the underworld. And so often it leads to interpretations of Hades in modern media as this kind of evil overlord. <laughs> From the honestly not so impressive, like the recent Netflix series uh, Blood of Zeus, to the honestly brilliant, not slightly sugar-coated Hades in Disney's Hercules. Just giving us some great lines and uh, just some great villain action. He's probably one of my favourite Disney villains. Even though I know he has little to nothing to do with the original Greek mythology Hades. It's sometimes hard to have a, a clear idea of the personalities of different gods. And it's actually sometimes even harder in terms of Hades because my understanding is that people kind of 
avoided talking about him in general because he was he was a god that was feared was associated with death it was kind of hard not to be but my understanding is that it was not so much in terms of seeing him as evil but more as this kind of stern stern administrator who uh you know it's just his this is just his day job or you know his his eternal night job and in a way that also makes the hades in the video game hades uh, in my opinion one of the more interesting reinterpretations of uh of hades in that sense because it's really from that point of view of somebody who is not definitely is definitely not a good necessarily good or a bad person um but it's just just a guy trying to do his job with that kind of extra spin on him being an awkward extremely awkward dad as well uh who has lots of lots of family issues to to work through which yeah, i'm not going to spoiler but uh like a lot of the game is centered around that what's really interesting to me is that this compelling design uh, and story behind hades means that you have these little different insights in which you can find out more about arms and armor find out about a range of different things in terms of greek mythology as well and for me What's really part of that is also the queer representation. Hades has a canonically bisexual lead, Zagreus, who has this intense relationship with Thanatos, uh, the god of death uh, himself, as well as uh, other characters such as Megara and Dusa. Sorry, Dusa. And it also features not only Achilles, but later on it's revealed Patroclus, and there's a whole storyline about trying to reunite them again and definitely just obviously does not shy away from the fact that they're both gay they're war husbands and you know obviously that's something that has been established across the centuries despite people wanting to just say that achilles and patroclus had a, a very intense friendship but it's great to see a game that just acknowledges that full-on and makes it a central part of the storyline and also what i found really great is that never at any point is zagreb oh my god it's raining so hard gods are manifesting. What I found really really positive about this game as well in terms of LGBTQI representation is that there's definitely something about having canonically queer characters in this game without having a storyline that's centered around conflict linked to their identities. Like there is a lot of family conflict in this game, uh, it's, it's kind of the core of the game, but never is it linked to a character's sexuality that, that's just not something that's ever really on the table it's just something that is accepted as part of that universe and that is sometimes just you know uh, actively commented upon in nothing but positive ways uh, and i think that's great and for that the game in more ways than one is biconic thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe like hit the bell for notifications and also comment what you think about the game just kind of different uh, games that you've played recently that engage with arms and armor in different ways i can't promise that i would specifically get the game to play it and then kind of comment on that aspect but it might be that i already have the game within my library and i've been thinking about those themes as well so you can follow me on my social media at carmen claire for more general rambling around swords arms and armor women with swords you can listen to my podcast, Bustles and Broadswords, around women with swords throughout history. And you can read my webcomic, Girls School of Knighthoods. Stay safe, sword lovers, and maybe video game lovers, and see you in another video.